Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <laughs> as we gather in person and virtually, uh, we've got a lot of folks online here and uh, back in Brazil, Bruno says. A uh, good many people signed that one from there. Um, and uh, we look forward to a discussion of what appears to be a, to have been a very successful visit of President Lula here in Washington. Uh, for those who don't recognize my smiling face, I'm Tony Harrington, co-chair with Tom Shannon of the Wilson Center Brazil Institute Advisory Council. And uh, both of us had the privilege of serving as U.S. ambassador in uh, the fascinating country of Brazil. Um, I uh, first, uh, though, I want to uh, take the honor of introducing Bruno Santos uh, for those who've not met, uh, who is officially, as of today, yeah. uh, <laughs> our new director of the Brazil Institute. Um, yeah. Um, after running the hurdles of uh, visa uh, acquisition and onboarding and so forth. Uh, before joining the Brazil Institute, uh, Bruna served as vice president and innovation director at the National School of Public Administration in Brazil, the leading school of government uh, in the country. Um, she was a director <coughs> previously at a public interest organization dedicated to promoting social development in Brazil. And very interestingly, from 2010 to 2013, she lived in Beijing, where she worked as a market analyst and co-founded a public relations firm uh, and invented some very interesting balloons while she was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bruna is a member of the Global Network of Eisenhower Fellows and has served as an adjunct professor at Columbia University's IMPA Global. She was honored by the World Economic Forum's Global Future on Agile Government, govern, Governance as one of the 50 most influential leaders championing innovation and policymaking. She has a master's in public administration from Columbia University and a bachelor's degree in international relations from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. She's a native Portuguese speaker, of course, uh, but also fluent in English and Spanish, proficient in Mandarin. I'm still having trouble with English, much less Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> um, she is not related to uh, fellow Brazilian George Santos, although <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised to see him claim yeah. uh, relationship. Um, so uh, now I'd like to turn the podium over to Bruna to introduce our special guest, re returning to his own prior Wilson Center home and to moderate a discussion of uh, regarding the Lula-Biden visit and U.S.-Brazil ways forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, for your encouraging and kind words. I must say that as Bruna Silva dos Santos, I want to also tell you that I'm not, I'm, I'm not also like related to President Lula da Silva. I'm sorry to disappoint here, but I'm very honored to assume the leadership of the Brazil Institute, which is a, an instrumental uh, organization fostering Brazil U.S. collaboration. And also, I'm very honored to be part of the Wilson Center in everything this house represents and also to be like working with so many like brilliant minds here obrigada aos amigos todos and uh, i must say that i'm arriving in a moment of like many um interest and uh, expectations about the relationship between brazil and the united states i think that uh, recently, I saw uh, a definition of the meeting saying that it was uh, an ambitious and practical and very uh, successful <coughs> meeting. And I hope that those words are the same used to describe the work that we will be doing <coughs> ahead of us here at the Brazil Institute. So 
With, with that said, I want to introduce you all to our program here today. This event is, uh, has the goal to interpret and reflect on the future of Brazil-US relations, having as uh, an immediate landmark the meeting that happened last Friday between President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva and Joe Biden. So to give us their perspective, we host here some of the most prominent American voices on Brazil-US relations. And I'm happy <coughs> to introduce you to Ricardo Zuniga. And after his remarks, I will moderate a conversation between uh, Zuniga and former uh, US ambassadors to Brazil, Tom Shannon and Anthony Harrington, who are me also, I'm also very honored to count on them as our co-chairs. So our first speaker, Ricardo Zuniga, is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs in the US Department of State, and he's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service. He previously served as a Senior Diplomatic Fellow here at the Walter Wilson Center and as US Consul General in Sao Paulo, Brazil and was a special assistant to the president at the National Security Council from 2012 to 2015, and had extensive experience working overseas <coughs> and in various U.S. government offices, such as the State Department's Office of Cuban Affairs and the U.S. Mission to the Organization of the American States. Thank you, Ricardo. I'm so glad you're here with us. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Bruna, and I will try to make your first day not mineral in a bad way. So I will. I, I really welcome uh, you to to Washington and to the Wilson Center. It was a real honor uh, to be here on your first day and to be here uh, back in a, a center that I love uh, so much and with a group of people that I respect so highly. Uh, and, and to have the opportunity to have this conversation uh, really is uh, just fantastic. And and I say it's an extension of what was actually a very successful visit from the perspective of the United States. Our, our, our first goal was really to set up the, a, a, an intense collaboration for the first six months uh, of this year with a new administration in Brazil. Um, we Typically when you have leader level discussions, uh, there are many months of, of preparation, of deliverables and negotiations. In this case, because it is a new government coming on board, the fact that uh, we feel quite fortunate that the United States was the first destination outside the region uh, for uh, President Lula, and we certainly uh, took note of that and what that meant. Uh, and uh, we sought to take advantage of that by, first and foremost, building a strong rapport between the leaders. I think uh, Ambassador Shannon knows very well the importance of having early and positive interaction between uh, President Lula and uh, the President of the United States. And uh, in many ways, we uh, borrowed from the model of Lula's engagement with President Bush during his first term. Uh, and we understood how important that was because there were always going to be areas of difference. To have that rapport between the leaders really means something, particularly with ones who put such a stock in personal relationships. Uh, so I do think that we are going to have, number one, it was very successful. We did build that rapport. We did build that engagement, not just between uh, the uh, two leaders, but between our cabinets. Uh, and we understood also that form was very important, that this was, uh, there was great symbolism attached to this, that uh, we, were sending, they, we were receiving a message from the new Brazilian administration by having the United States be the first uh, stop outside the region. Uh, and the, the form of U.S. visits doesn't always lend itself to, to kind of convey the importance that you place in a relationship. So we wanted to make sure that that happened. And thanks to fantastic work by our protocol teams and by our teams at the NSC uh, and by uh, our groups on both sides of the delegation, a meeting that was on paper for 45 minutes went two hours. And the first hour was just the two leaders alone. Uh, and uh, I can tell you as uh, somebody who, who's, uh, we've, we've all seen the importance of having that personal one-on-one -on -one engagement, not, not, uh, not even with a plus one, just the chance to talk alone. Uh, and that was a very, uh, clearly a meeting that both <coughs> leaders enjoyed quite a bit. Uh, and I think that's particularly important at a time where the United States and Brazil uh, share many challenges. We have an agenda that we're going to work, and we can, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but the truth is that these are leaders who face very significant challenges uh, as well, and the, the mirror between the United States and Brazil can be overplayed. But there's a lot of symmetry. 
uh, in terms of the challenges that the two countries uh, face with regard to the major social and political issues. Uh, and uh, that certainly was something that was a topic of, of discussion. So uh, it was not a normal working visit either in the sense of the kind of the scale of participation on both sides. I just wanted to take a moment because this is I had to bring the list of participants on the U.S. side because it was it was longer than normal. We had, of course, the president. We had Secretary Blinken, Secretary Austin, Secretary Holland, Secretary Raimondo, Jake Sullivan, uh, Ambassador Bagley, of course, uh, uh, John Kerry, uh, uh, Senator Dodd, uh, uh, Brian Nichols, and Juan Gonzalez on the U.S. side. And that was for the expanded meeting, which was uh, – it, it, that's, it is atypical to have such a large delegation of U.S. cabinet members uh, for a bilateral meeting of this nature. On the Brazilian side, we did this because on the Brazilian side, we had, of course, President Lula. We had Foreign Minister Vieira, uh, Minister Haddadji, uh, sec um, uh, Senator Wagner, Senator, excuse me, uh, 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 Secretary uh, Marina Silva, Celso Amorim was there, of course, Daniela da Silva, and Edson Gonçalves of uh, Institutional Security Cabinet was there. And the message that we received was that they wanted to have this intense level of engagement and have our teams uh, see each other and talk. Uh, and uh, we uh, very much appreciated that, tried to reciprocate. And you will see that same intensity in the kind of travel between our two capitals uh, over the coming months. Um, I'm just going to list a couple of the main takeaways because I think it's uh, yeah. better to have the discussion. Uh, one is our, this is from the U.S. side, and I, I will try just based on what I've seen to very quickly recap how we understand Brazil sees the trip. One, uh, I think our takeaway is that Brazil knows that we see them as a partner on the biggest issues of the day, um, that being climate change, uh, the global economic response to the current downturn, um, the war in Ukraine, uh, democratic erosion, uh, and all of these are areas where we are more aligned than not, uh, and where the areas of difference are, are the ones that we always anticipate, the ones that are normal in the relationship and that we're familiar with in each direction. Uh, we're just getting started on the issues of climate and the Amazon. Um, we will have more once our teams uh, have an opportunity to meet and understand each other's uh, objectives at a more senior level, not just with regard to the Amazon basin, but with regard to the global uh, multilateral effort as well. Uh, we, I mentioned that we will have other senior uh, and uh, cabinet-level exchanges coming soon. We do respect Carnival, so not too soon. Um, and we expect the main agenda topics to be, in fact, climate, uh, multi the multilateral, uh, excuse me, bilateral, multilateral economic issues, uh, cooperation, the fight against exclusion, where obviously uh, this is both presidents <coughs> feel that as a core part of their own identities. Uh, collaboration at the G20 with Brazil's forthcoming presidency is going to be an important topic of discussion. Uh, global security issues and global governance issues, UN Security Council reform, regional matters like Venezuela and migration, which touch both of our countries. Uh, and then finally, uh, the perspective uh, from Brazil as we understand it uh, to this point. Number one, uh, as I mentioned before, the important symbol of going to the United States as the first non-regional trip. and using this as the successful reinsertion of Brazil as an active global protagonist. That seemed to be a very clear message that, that uh, um, Planalto wanted to send. Again, the importance of the symmetry between the strains on our democracies and a shared outlook on uh, the preserving not just democracy in form, but democratic culture. And I think that's a really important point. That's a, that goes beyond the form and really is about how democracy is felt. Uh, they ensured U.S. support for the Amazon Fund and engagement in support of Amazon Basin initiatives, absolutely the case. Uh, I, we believe that it really made an impact on Lula that President Biden is seen as pro-labor. He heard this from the AFL-CIO, mentioned it several times. This was something that was very important to him. Uh, he, he read the State of the Union speech, and it clearly made an impact on him as well, how much their identities really align in terms of how they see their role. Uh, we also believe that uh, President Lula was struck by how much of our domestic and social challenges seem to match up. That we, there was constant reference to these uh, issues. Uh, and I think globally, uh, finally, they see this as the first part of a navigation between the United States and China. I mean, we see this slightly differently, um, but I think that's very much a, a, the narrative uh, as we understand it from the perspective from Brasilia. So those are some main elements, and happy to talk in greater detail about any of those.
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ricardo. It's fantastic. And I want to start with a question that um, I will ask Ambassador Tom Shannon and Anthony Harrington, because then they can give us a little bit more of the perspective they had from from the meeting. Um, some observers of Brazil, including myself, they were calling this meeting as um, as an important mi milestone in what we see as a new era for Brazil. U.S. relations, and um, how do you interpret the symbolism of this meeting, and also what are, of course, we saw the, the, the focus on defending democracy being said, both from Biden and uh, Lula, but what are the concrete measures that we can expect from the U.S. Uh, to defend democracy in the hemisphere? Well, thank you very much, Bruna, and welcome. Uh, we're thank very you. happy to have you here at the Brazil Institute and at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And, uh, it is to our benefit, so we're delighted. And uh, what a pleasure to have Ricardo Zuniga here with us today, uh, someone who knows Brazil so well uh, and is so committed to the U.S.-Brazil bilateral relationship. Um, I, I think Ricardo said something very important uh, in regard to the U.S. understanding of the visit, uh, which is that it's the beginning of a, a revival of uh, a partnership between two great nations, two great peoples, uh, but in this instance, uh, two leaders who have very important political projects in front of them. And building that personal relationship will have, I think, a profound <coughs> impact on how the, the governments of both countries relate to each other. And in this regard, it's worth noting that uh, President Lula himself highlighted that this meeting was reestablishing the U.S.-Brazil relationship within democracy. And in this regard, I think that both President Biden and President Lula recognize that they face significant challenges domestically in showing that democracy can deliver the goods and that democracy can address the concerns that people have in the 21st century, uh, but that also the relationship between the two countries is more than uh, a, a litany of strategic projects uh, or possible cooperation. Uh, that it really is about how our societies relate to each other, two societies committed uh, to democracy, not only as a form of government, uh, but as uh, Ricardo noted, as a culture, as, as a way of life. And I think we are going to be seeing over the next weeks and months as we have numerous U.S. officials traveling to Brazil and Brazilian officials traveling to the United States, uh, an opportunity to begin to... <coughs> to fill out the substance of, of that relationship. And I think it's going to be very exciting. Very good. Tony. Um, well, I, of course, agree with everything Tom Ricardo say. Uh, uh, and Can you speak closer to the mic? OK. Um, in um, the public comments, uh, I, I was struck by uh, some of uh, President Lula's in particular uh, in which he uh, said that the Biden State of the Union could have been delivered and well received in Brazil. Um, <clears throat> so um, it, it was a kind of a specific sign of the alignment that was being sought and, and found, hopefully. <clears throat> um, um, he also, President Lula also uh, said that. Uh, in front of him is reinserting Brazil in the world generally, um, that uh, Brazil had isolated itself under a certain former president um, and uh, <clears throat> has no fight with any country and uh, looks to um, rebuild uh, some bridges and reassert uh, a role for Brazil and the Brazilian government uh, in uh, global security and uh, affairs, um, and I think um, hopefully there will be a continuing uh, dialogue in which we will share views and information on other parts of the world uh, and uh, educate each other and uh, cooperate where we can. Um, I. <clears throat> seems to me uh, that we have <clears throat> sort of an overarching s uh, 
same unfortunate condition, and that is polarization in the U.S., polarization in Brazil, uh, leading to uh, the uh, presence or existence or creation of more extremism. Uh, President Lula said we should never have another January 6th uh, in the U.S. or another January 8th uh, in Brazil, <clears throat> and uh, emphasizing the rule of law and uh, defense of democracy. Um, so um, I, d I don't know, though, I, I wonder if we could think of Central as being a little more of a moderate, uh, maybe a right moderate um, factor than we ha seem to have in the U.S. in terms of moderates these days. Um, so anyway, I do congratulations to Ricardo, to you and your colleagues for making it happen and turn out so well. And uh, Boa Sorti and the ensuing uh, dialogue and endeavors. I would turn to climate finance and what came out of the visit, which is the announcement of the U.S. joining the Amazon Fund, a big deal for Brazil. It's somehow like going to bring others with it. And in the joint statement that you, of the two countries, um, it says that the U.S. President Joe Biden has put, promised to work with Congress to fund protection in the Amazon rainforest. So my question is, how does this promise um, change the way that the U.S. traditionally deals with climate finance for Brazil and the region? How, what, what is the difference now? And two is, as we move forward, how the U.S. politics may affect, meaning like the, the conversation between Biden and Congress, may affect uh, Biden's plans to fulfill his election pledge to protect the Amazon rainforest. So I, just very briefly on this, I would say uh, a couple of things are important. One is that uh, one approach that we firmly support uh, is uh, Brazil's effort to deal with this as an Amazon basin issue and to do mm -hmm. this multilaterally within South America. That's crucial uh, because desmatamento is a real is a significant factor. The deforestation is a significant factor across borders. If you just take uh, what has happened, unfortunately, in Venezuela uh, with uh, a, a massive illegal deforestation and mining. Uh, that is affecting uh, Brazil and other countries and its borders, that's an example of the importance of doing this on a regional basis. So that, that I think, is different. Dealing with this as a, as a regional matter rather than a, as a bilateral one is one that is very aligned with the way that we see the entire challenge. Uh, and so we welcome Brazil's leadership on that and want to be able to respond to that. Uh, of course, there is also, uh, I think, uh, this is also a learning period for us in terms of understanding how uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion about the bioeconomy and about the need to address the needs of the population of the Amazon basin and to think about this in a holistic way uh, that it's uh, environmental um, preservation in a way that is reflective of the needs of a community that actually already exists there and has views and wants to have inputs. This is something I think that is very welcome uh, on the U.S. side uh, as well. Uh, in terms of uh, where this sits uh, on the priorities for the United States on climate, it's extremely high, and it's understood that way. Um, uh, the uh, uh, former Secretary Kerry's role in this symbolizes the importance that we place not just on the topic, but uh, uh, the fact that we see this as something that uh, transcends uh, administrations, uh, we will work very actively uh, in terms of his level of engagement on this, certainly, but also very actively in terms of uh, trying to make the case about how important it is to support what we see as a promising regional initiative. If I could uh, just add a, a few thoughts. Um, for me, it, it struck me that uh, the U.S. commitment to the Amazon Fund was a recognition that Brazil was back uh, in a a responsible way on environmental issues and that the United States was recognizing that uh, by making a commitment to the Amazon Fund. Um, but maybe more importantly, and Ricardo highlighted this, was the multilateral nature of um, Brazil's efforts uh, in South America. Um, 
the focus on the Amazon, at least in the press, has been almost entirely on Brazil. Um, but nearly every South American country is Amazonian, with just a few exceptions. Uh, and this gives Brazil an opportunity to build a South American approach uh, to deforestation, to biodiversity, to protection of indigenous peoples, and promotion of, of responsible economic development um, within a, a rainforest environment. Uh, and uh, as a continental approach, it gives the United States an opportunity to engage, along with our European partners, uh, on a, a uh, uh, really a, a South American project, uh, which could bring funding and, and the cutting edge environmental technologies to bear in a way that could have a, a really dramatic and, and remarkable impact. And so I, for me at least, uh, in many ways, this might be um, the least understood but the most exciting aspect of, of the U.S.-Brazil relationship at this point. And he was obviously quite serious about it, about it delivering uh, in that he, not only looking at it regionally, but uh, he was concerned that there be some international forum that uh, could ad address the issues, make some decisions, uh, hold people accountable, and he mentioned the UN, he mentioned uh, G20, which um, they'll have a direct leadership role in. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it needed to be, and it was, a central topic for discussion and, and collective action. So talking about the G20 and um like the fact that Lula is somehow bringing Brazil back to, on track to what is a traditional pattern in foreign policy. In the interview that he gave to CNN here last Thursday, he said uh, that he refused uh, ammunition to Ukraine because, quote, I don't want to go, to go join the war, I want to end the war. And he seems to be very confident that the forum, uh, a, for a forum such as a G20 is needed to moderate conflicts. And he clearly has sought to be a leader in the region that could broker uh, like conflicts and a potential truce between Russia and Ukraine. How does this stance resonate here in the U.S. and, and how it, it came out of the meeting in the statement saying that he was, a, for the first time, clearly condemning the attacks? made by Russia was the first time that in a joint statement Lula has stated that. So how, it, how his stance resonates here? So I think, first, first of all, I think it's very important that Brazil, as, as Brazil, has firmly, firmly condemned uh, Russia's aggression uh, as a violation of the UN Charter. Uh, and uh, President Lula and his team had um, also indicated that they viewed the uh, Russia's attack as a violation of the UN Charter uh, and as the offense, uh, and the uh, the fact is that uh, we all want a resolution of this conflict. This it, it, every country in the world is affected by this. Uh, food insecurity is driven by this. Uh, the economic recovery is is severely hampered by this. There is a significant effort to try to bring this war to an end. I'd say that the United States uh, also recognizes that, number one, uh, this war would end uh, tomorrow if Russia stopped fighting, and Ukraine doesn't have that luxury, doesn't have that ability. So we understand the nature of who is the violator and which is the aggrieved party. Uh, and as a democratically elected leader, uh, there are uh, enormous pressures, obviously, on President Zelensky to defend his, his country's territory, and we respect that and have supported that. I think that uh, there is certainly a, a, a strong support for having a, a broad international response uh, to uh, bring about peace, uh, but uh, to make sure that that peace is a, is a just and lasting peace uh, requires as much collaboration as, as we can possibly bring to bear. Uh, we want to hear from Brazil uh, on this. Brazil's role is absolutely critical. Uh, and uh, so we are going to continue to engage because we think that uh, Brazil, as a as a country with a long vocation in support of peace across multiple administrations, 
uh, has an, is an important leader. Uh, it is our view that uh, we should continue to focus the international community on the fact that there, we can't have a false equivalence. Uh, this is a violation that must be corrected uh, and addressed if the UN Charter is to be reinforced uh, uh, at the end of this conflict. And so that is very firmly the U.S. view and something that we're going to continue to be uh, holding in our discussions. But uh, again, this is something that, uh, that uh, our leaders have discussed and we've continued at, at, uh, address at a high level. Uh, and again, uh, we think that uh, Brazil's role certainly is uh, very important in this and other conflicts. Would you expect President Lula to raise the subject in Beijing? I, I'm certain. He seems to uh, view it as an absolutely critical uh, element of, of uh, his administration to find a way to help bring this conflict to an end because of the impact that it has on global peace and security. So uh, I would be surprised if he doesn't raise it in most of his international meetings. And if I could, um, Brazil has come off the fence, and that's very important. Um, as Foreign Minister Mauro Vieira said in, a, in an interview in, in Veja, and as the president himself had said, there's now a clear recognition by Brazil of exactly. uh, <clears throat> Russian misbehavior um, and Ukraine defending itself uh, legitimately. Um, <clears throat> uh, but where I think the United States needs to focus more in the relationship is how to use Brazil to address the consequences of the war. And Ricardo mentioned them, food insecurity, energy insecurity, inflation, uh, among other things. Um, the challenge Brazil will face diplomatically uh, is that two of its most important historic partners, the United States and the European Union, have very firm views <laughs> on what's happening in Ukraine, um, Russia's culpability, and what comes next. <clears throat> and quite frankly, um, as important as peace will be, um, uh, peace will not be um, defined only in terms of end, of end of conflict. It will be determined by who is in what territory, for how long, what kind of international commitments are made, what kind of security commitments are made, how refugees are, are addressed, but maybe more importantly, how violation of humanitarian law is addressed, yeah. mm -hmm. especially in regard to violence and the brutality that, that Russian forces have directed uh, against Ukrainians, um, and Brazil has not addressed this yet. Uh, but as, as we get deeper into this conflict and as the, the, the global community looks for a way to stop the fighting, then the, the more difficult phase comes, which is what does a peace look like? What is Russia's, Russia's relationship <clears throat> with Europe and the rest of the world in the aftermath of this? And here, um, Brazil will play a very important role, but it will be tested. So um, my last question, and then I open for the audience. I just want to say hello and thank you for the 110 people that are watching us uh, online now. Mm -hmm. I wish they were here, but it's a good number. I'm really happy. And uh, I want to move to uh, global economic recession and how Brazil and the United States are, are facing it. In what could be, in your opinion, like, I'd say, quick wins in terms of uh, that both administrations could uh, benefit from in terms of like political and tangible economic wins both both ways like what are the pro what should be the priorities in this front I see you looking at other people for quick wins so I uh, this is good uh, <laughs> so I think the hard thing is there are no quick wins at this point in in this economy where our free trade agreements are not really uh, under discussion or debate it's a question of trade facilitation uh, and I think that there are really important initiatives that are underway to achieve uh, uh, medium-term wins. And I, th because, and I say that short-term is difficult because countries are working on an emergency brace basis to bring inflation under control. Um, we are relatively fortunate in the United States, but that's not true in much of the world. And so this is something that is a huge factor. So many states remain very active in terms of dealing with the immediate effects of the, of the economic shocks that we're seeing uh, in large part because of the conflict and, and res residual shocks from the uh, uh, pandemic. But uh, in terms of uh, how we see this, there's a, there's a couple of things. I, I certainly will not prescribe for, for Brazil, uh, <coughs> but we do know that uh, there are uh, 
there is some deep thinking underway in Brazil about ways to both relieve pressure on uh, society as a result of these economic shocks, but also um, to facilitate trade and make uh, taxes less complex and deal with sort of long-standing structural challenges that feed into the Custo Brasil. Right? This is that, I think addressing that on the Brazilian side will certainly attract investment. Uh, we know that Brazil is very interested in U.S. investment. We are interested in, in having trade in both directions and having investment in both directions, and, and that is very uh, uh, going to be very important to us. Multilateral bank reform uh, is going to be crucial. One area where the United States has been very active in this administration uh, is in terms of middle income and upper middle income countries, getting uh, ensuring that they have access to financing that might have been complicated by uh, um, uh, World Bank indexing and, and where they fit on that. When it's specific to promoting uh, economic growth and job creation, I think that there's, and to dealing with major challenges, I think for us also uh, another factor is the interest of dealing, using this opportunity to uh, invest in renewables and invest in the parts of the economy that are going to be so important for future energy resources. Brazil's a huge player in, in that space. The United States is a huge player in that space. There should be areas of common, uh, for common gain. Uh, the United States remains the, the largest market for Brazilian manufactured goods. Brazil remains a massive market for the United States in terms of both goods and services. Uh, so what we see is uh, ample opportunity for reducing those uh, uh, the, the barriers uh, to trade uh, under our current terms. Uh, and for uh, seeing where there is a, a room, for example, uh, in supply chains and critical minerals, where Brazil is, mm. again, a very important source uh, country. And so that, that is something that we are going to be uh, including in our conversations. I have one thought uh, about something that could be done soon, needs to be done soon. I can't remember. Did you mention Venezuela as a topic of discussion? Very briefly. Okay. Um, but uh, as people know, uh, the situation is uh, fraught, but uh, there is a window here of engagement and possible opportunity, uh, humanitarian needs uh, uh, to be addressed and so forth. And I feel like Brazil and President Lula in particular could play a uh, international statesman role in helping the Maduro administration move enough that the, uh, those concerned uh, in opposition could uh, uh, find a way to move things forward for the sake of Venezuelans uh, <clears throat> um, and, and the region. Um, so um, personally, I hope that uh, Brazil picks up that uh, charge and uh, because of the dialogue is going on now, it would be important for them to act fairly soon. To act as a broker as well, right? Tom, you want to comment? Well, I, I think Ricardo's right. Um, quick wins in the, the field of investment, trade, uh, and any number of <coughs> agreements are going to be challenging. Um, but I think that we need to make sure that we don't allow the relationship to be captured by our governments uh, and that we understand that what's really important and dramatic about this relationship is how our societies relate to each other. And so if anybody asked me, I would say the most important thing we could do for Brazil in the short term is a visa waiver program uh, or at least putting the resources into our consulates and embassies to uh, allow people to apply for visas immediately and not have to wait. Um, but I, I certainly believe that if countries like Poland can have a visa waiver program, Brazil can have one. Well, I'd like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will open for questions. We have a couple here. I will ask for uh, help with the microphones. It's right in the back. We have to, I just will ask for you, please, to introduce yourself and um, before asking your question. I'm sorry. Igor, and then uh, this is sorry in front of him. Hello, um, I'm Igor. Uh, I'm a reporter at Folha de São Paulo, 
and currently doing a sabbatical here at the Wilson Center, not at the Brazil Institute, at the Kissinger Institute in U.S. and China Relations. Uh, my question, of course, is related to China. Uh, you do mention about like Lula's visit to China in March. Besides uh, the Russian invasion in Ukraine and like Lula's um, Lula willing to mediate that, and he did mention that he he thinks it's time for China to get involved in that and form a club of countries not directly involved in the conflict to mediate peace between Russia and Ukraine. Um, more recently, some sources at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Brazil have been saying me that uh, to me that um, uh, Lula do want to mention ways for the United States and China to cooperate together in Brazil for the protection of the Amazon rainforest. And environmental policy and climate resilience is probably one of the few areas where the United States and China can still sit down and get to an agreement. So I was wondering if you guys think there is still room for like Brazil to mediate not only the situation in Russia and Ukraine, but also uh, the relationship between China and the U.S. itself, like be Brazil being the main destination for uh, Chinese investment in the world, has like it, it was the first strategic partner of uh, China, and also is culturally and geographically close to the U.S. So is there any room for Brazil to be this bridge between the U.S. and China on many issues besides the war? Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Well, so... Broadly speaking, I think it's important, even in times when we have balloons and obvious tension in our bilateral relationship with China, to say we have a very broad and complicated relationship that involves enormous economic exchanges, enormous cultural exchanges. We have a, a very broad relationship uh, with China, even during these times of tension. Brazil has very broad relations with China that go beyond uh, uh, the trade relationship. And, and we uh, see that as, uh, as absolutely a factor uh, that is, uh, that's very important. We have areas where the United States and Brazil probably are more aligned on issues related to China. For example, China's treatment of, uh, of debt, uh, which is a, a, a something that both of our countries believe is problematic in the current international environment. Uh, and certainly, uh, Brazil has a vocation as a peacemaker and a mediator and so forth. And I think there's certainly, uh, you know, potentially opportunity there. But I, I would also say that uh, just coming back to Ambassador Shannon's point, as we, one of the real, <laughs> this is a time of democratic erosion around the world. And one of the reasons that the society to society relationship is so important it's because we have two societies that basically want the same kind of future. When we think about governments delivering public goods, Brazilians and people in the United States tend to view those goods in a very similar fashion. And they seem to view the outcome in a certain way. And that does not exclude Brazil playing a role and having a different form of interaction with China than the United States is going to have. But I think over the course of our relationship, that becomes extremely important as an anchor to everything else that we do that we have a mutual stake in having a world that is safe for democracies f in a very significant way and at a time where the challenges are both social uh, and internal and international. Uh, and so that certainly is a, a factor as well. We don't lose sight of that in the way that we have a, a very deep set of aligned interests that are not exclusive of other areas where we might have different approaches, and we welcome that. Question. We have another question here, and then oh, one back there. Uh, I'm retired FSO Timothy Tao. I know these gentlemen, and I want to know this lady because my third assignment in the Foreign Service, 31 years, was Consul in Porto Alegre, Brazil. He'll follow okay. Portuguese. And a lot of the people that talk about things in Brazil, talk about the nasty military government, in my experience 40 years ago, and I knew the most powerful general because he was down in southern Brazil. Why? Because he told Yankees that he hated communists. I smiled. I don't always smile. But he hated Spaniards. He hated, hated Uruguayans, Argentines. And those funny people to the South, who tried to amuse me by talking about that. So my general 
was a better human being than all the civilians that came down in nice clothes to talk to the U.S. Consul, go to the Chamber of Commerce lunch, good food, and they were corrupt. In my inbox, I knew exactly who was behaving the way asshole Donald Trump does, did, and all those things, but it was in my inbox, and like a good Irish American, I smile. I want to ask my question, instead of being so scholarly like my colleagues here, is when I finish talking, do you agree with me, or do you think, I know all three of you, or do you think you should correct me? Um, I had 31 years, starting in the Kennedy administration, all dictatorships. Francisco Franco twice, and then the State Department wants to punish you, so I was sent to Cochabamba, Bolivia, General Rene Barrientos Sortuño, a nifty guy, and I fly around in his helicopter with him. Then I was in La Paz. I hated it because I couldn't breathe, and I was just turning 30. And then, uh, uh, then I was sent to Porto Alegre. Then I had a wife then, I don't anymore. Henry Kister asked her where she wanted to go, and she said, Europe? So I had Belgium, but I was the Yankee Cito doing all of Africa. Really sons of bitches down there, and we knew who they were because it was in our inbox. Uh, and then I had two years in Cuba, and my number one colleague was the KGB station chief. I'm sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, <laughs> yes. When you know everything, and I just turned 89, so I should be... What is your question? I'm sorry. Do I, do you agree with everything I say? And the most important thing is keep it simple rather than too scholarly and do what I used to do when I was teaching sixth and eighth grade. Repeat it, repeat it, keep it simple, repeat it and repeat it rather than bore people with too much crap. Thank you for your contribution. We have another uh, question there. It's going to be a hard question, though. I know Cindy, so uh. Thank you so much. It's Cindy. wonderful, Ricardo, to have you back. Wonderful to see you and, and, uh, and Bruna, um, Tony, and, and, and Tom. You guys have been such great partners for the Wilson Center and the Brazil Institute for so long. Um, my question is for Ricardo and has to do with the availability of resources to back up the um, various kinds of initiatives that have been, that, that are so clearly important in the U.S.-Brazil relationship, whether it's on deforestation or, or climate or any number of other things. Um, and I just have to say I applaud the return to diplomacy and the seriousness with which the Biden administration has um, renewed the relationship with the Lula administration. My question for Brazil, but also about other parts in the hemisphere, is how the United States is going to actually marshal financial resources that will make these various kinds of things viable. Thanks. Oh, look, I, I, the in the case specific to Brazil, it, you know, they, they, it is a country with a massive economy and set of resources uh, of its own. Um, U.S. resources and the Brazil relationship tend to be complementary and really much more, um, not symbolic, but they are a, a way to facilitate other work that's happening and mostly being financed in Brazil by Brazilian institutions. But also, I, I would say that uh, it also demands, when you're talking about major investments, such as in climate and in the Amazon basin, investments at scale that require legislation and legislative support and buy-in. Uh, and so that the, there are the things that you can do on the spot that uh, are uh, for um, the regional approach, but this is an administration that has prioritized very significant investments uh, in climate, in resilience, uh, and, in, uh, and in energy. And those are, I think, areas that are absolutely ripe for uh, significant contributions. But I think the other piece of it is understanding that, uh, and we've applied this everywhere, that in terms of resources, the main resource is not foreign assistance. Foreign assistance is actually a pretty uh, insufficient resource for most of the problems the region faces. Much of what we're trying to do is, for example, on the issue of migration, 
which is at historic levels across the region, 11 million people on the move, 6.5 million of them from Venezuela alone. The entire region is feeling this in a way that it hasn't seen before. And so, for example, we're trying to draw greater UN resources and greater uh, IOM resources to help communities that are affected by this so that xenophobia doesn't grow so you don't have an impact that is going to be negative to uh, other, um, uh, other parts of society in, in dealing with what is, again, historically huge uh, flows. Uh, in terms of, uh, again, access for middle and upper middle income uh, countries to resources that have been generally reserved for countries that were not in those uh, in those places where there's a meeting, an intersessional meeting of CARICOM tomorrow, our economic cooperation and what we can do at the multilateral uh, level is going to be a centerpiece of that conversation, especially on energy and, and on uh, climate resilience, because these are among the most affected parts of the uh, of the world in that way. But a lot of this has to do also with um, reducing these uh, barriers to trade that can happen under existing mechanisms and finding ways to... Uh, uh, extract the greatest uh, resource out of what exists and is in place, and helping governments make their resources actually reach populations. I think as a general matter, we understand that the entire region faces very severe limitations in terms of fiscal space to meet the popular demands, legitimate popular demands. So helping governments figure out how to do that, I think is, is going to be a, it is a significant part of our work um, the role of the Inter-American Development Bank uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the role in particular of the private sector uh, as an engine for growth is something that has been highlighted in Central America uh, by uh, this administration. The vice president's call to action has brought $3.2 billion in investments to Central America. I mean, the, we're, the, the idea here is that it, it really has to be a, a deliberate effort to uh, extract the maximum benefit out of existing uh, resources and breaking down barriers uh, that have been longstanding, and uh, a, that's mostly at the multilateral level. Uh, so, uh, but to, to close it out on it, trying not to be bureaucratic and trying to be very straightforward, um, and there's no one who has the resources to deal quickly uh, with the problems that we're facing. So it really is, how can you collaborate to remove the most significant barriers to economic recovery? First one being the war, and I think that, that is why. Uh, we are so active on that front, uh, in addition to the humanitarian disaster in Ukraine itself. We have one more question here, and then uh, we'll have to wrap it up. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's been great to listen to all of you. Um, Carl Meacham with FTI um, Consulting. Um, I've listened attentively to the uh, uh, ideas, to the definition uh, and characterization of the trip. Um, it just seems for folks that have been following Brazil for such a long time that we just keep on moving at such a glacial speed. Um, you've mentioned different ideas on investment. Uh, you've mentioned different views uh, uh, on how we should move the ball forward. Uh, short term seems to be difficult. Describe a little bit what the midterm could look like uh, as far as trade is concerned. Everybody seems to be avoiding any type of market access agreement, any type of tax agreements. Maybe those things are old-fashioned now. Uh, but trade between the two countries uh, and finding a framework, an institutional framework going forward, seems to be a nice sort of long-term sort of idea to really enhance this relationship. How do you see moving forward uh, sort of in an, in an institutional way that you know, moves away from what we can do, I guess, today, which I think is quite limited. The environment in the Congress is difficult. But how would you see this going forward? And is trade in a more sort of defined <coughs> legal trade framework something that you could see in the cards? Bruno, do you have good answers to that? <laughs> <laughs> no quick wins, right? No quick Maybe. <laughs> so I, I think, uh, first of all, it, I, anyone really at this table uh, could is, is equal to, the, to answering that question. I will give you my piece. I think trade uh, FTAs are uh, difficult 
un, for any country under these circumstances. I also think, and I, I alluded to this in a prior answer, there's a lot of um, progress that can be made in reducing the custo Brasil, uh, and that creates opportunities uh, in Brazil that would be invite companies to try to take advantage of the massive human uh, capital and industrial capacity that already exists in Brazil. So a lot of the pieces are in place. Uh, the natural resources uh, make that, uh, you know, alone make uh, Brazil a, a, a massive player. Uh, there are huge investments that have to happen in infrastructure. There's a lot of potential. The issue from uh, that we've all faced in trying to bring in, say, in, not just investment, but to facilitate services and construction and so forth and to participate in uh, public licitations and, so the, and, the, and the rest is the complexity of doing of doing business in Brazil, and for Brazil, the complexity of doing business in the United States, and of making, it's just not been a relationship that has ever really meet, met its potential. And it's a $100 billion relationship. It's our third largest relationship in the, in the Americas after North America and our, and our uh, you know, and uh, so we have, we have, uh, I'm sorry, our second one after North America. So we have this massive potential. The challenge is uh, making the pieces match uh, in a way that is going to be legally possible in both countries. You talked about the glacial pace. That's because we have large, complex governments that respond to public demand. This is the real reason. Like they, these are, we have massive democracies that are responsive to popular trends, and to, and one of those is a uh, certain skepticism of of uh, free trade, and the fact is that when people pay the cost of opening, it's hard to make progress in those. And so these are, but it's worth it. In this particular relationship, it is absolutely and very clearly worth it. Um, that is why we have such an intense uh, relationship between our, our uh, ministries when it relates to, for example, um, uh, reducing non-tariff barriers, easing the cost of doing business, reducing each other's restrictions on, on uh, uh, imports and facilitating uh, uh, administrative processes. That's where the real gains are. It seems boring, and it's the most important thing we can do. Yeah. Uh, and so that, I think, has to remain kind of at the center of our work. Tax treaty wouldn't be bad. <laughs> I think I signed one when I was ambassador, and then the Congress... <laughs> Congress uh, rejected it. Here? No, there. In Brazil. Yeah, I think that some of the infrastructure is there, but just to tell you, I think uh, priority number one, two, and three for Lula in his administration is passed the tax reform in the first semester. So there are like so some uh, structural reforms coming up. And this is more of a Brazilian perspective on, on the things which are something that um, Brazil Institute has been doing for... Um, like since Lula took office, we are doing this project called Brazil 100, following uh, different events uh, that is like coming up, coming out of the administration, focusing especially on the future of democracy and institutional normalization, but also on different other uh, aspects of the of Lula's government and trying to interpret that to the U.S. audience and international audience. So I invite you to follow the Brazil Institute and everything we've been doing in terms of programming. And I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank our panelists for this fantastic and very insightful conversation. And everyone watching us from home, thank you so much. <laughs>